Hello everyone, and welcome back to Alt-Roll's Class Breakdown Series. I'm Bill, Admin and Instructor for Alt-Roll, and today we're going to continue our Class Breakdown Series to give a general overview of all the classes in D&D 5th Edition to help you find the one you want to play. Today, let's examine the Sorcerer, casters who must learn to master the great power infused within their very being. Sorcerers are a rare breed of caster that shares a lot of similarities to the wizard while being slightly better for newer players due to a lower level of complexity. The source of where this power traces back to can vary from lineage to lineage. The touch of a demon, the blessing of a baby by a dryad, drinking unfiltered water from a magical spring, and many many more can inadvertently grant an individual and all their descendants the power to control magic innately. While these powers may run in families, they often come unexplained to the sorcerer, leading many to leave home with their uncontrolled powers to find answers and put them to good use as adventurers. When it comes to their role in the party, the Sorcerer is a self-sufficient caster that falls somewhere between the Wizard and the Warlock when it comes to their options within the party. Because the Sorcerer has to know spells to cast them like a Warlock, they have less variety in their spell selection than the Wizard, who can prepare more spells per level. However, the Sorcerer has more spell slots than the Warlock, meaning they can rely on leveled spells much like the Wizard can. With these aspects in mind, the Sorcerer tends to fill the role of a backline blaster caster, but can be easily outfitted to work as a control or utility caster instead. To help summarize the Sorcerer and clarify its role, let's go through a quick pros and cons list that I've organized into three main points for each. Starting with the pros, the first is that the Sorcerer has great ranged damage. Much like the wizard, the sorcerer's ability to pump out ranged spell damage is hard to match with other classes, sharing many of the same spells that make the wizard so deadly and having unique abilities to increase the damage of them when cast. The second main pro of the sorcerer is that they have good support options. While not having direct healing options to replace a good cleric or paladin, the sorcerer has some good buffing spells, class features, and subclass abilities that empower their allies to be better when in proximity to the Sorcerer. Finally, the last main positive of the Sorcerer class is that they have good roleplay options. Since they utilize Charisma as their casting ability, Sorcerers operate very well in a lot of roleplay scenarios that require speech or deception to get through. Accented by spells that allow them to charm or trick others as well, the Sorcerer is a great class to choose as the person to do all the talking for the party when out and about. So with these pros in mind, we can see that the Sorcerer is a dangerous and charismatic caster that has good options to choose from. However, there are some negatives to the class we need to discuss, the first of which being that the Sorcerer is very fragile. Of all the things to take from the wizard, their fragility should not have been one of them. While they do have one subclass that makes them slightly more resilient, the Sorcerer should still be treated delicately when it comes to combat situations. The second main negative of the Sorcerer is that they are bad in melee. If there were ever a class to keep out of melee entirely, it's the Sorcerer. With no armor proficiencies, low hit points, and little to no good melee weapon proficiencies to be gained, the Sorcerer should be kept as far away from the front line as possible. Finally, the last main negative of the Sorcerer is that they have a limited spell selection. The Sorcerer doesn't get access to as many spells as other casters do, especially at early levels, and swapping them out is limited to level ups only. This rigid spell selection means that the Sorcerer player needs to know what role they fill and what spells they need from the get-go as they'll have less options to choose from during gameplay. With the overview laid out and the pros and cons analyzed, let's review the unique class abilities that the Sorcerer earns as they level up. Starting at level 1, the Sorcerer gains their spellcasting and chooses a Sorceress origin. Starting with their spellcasting, the Sorcerer is a Charisma caster, 
meaning their spell attack modifier and spell save DC are both affected by their charisma score. The sorcerer starts with four cantrips known and two first level spell slots. They gain higher level spell slots every odd level, gaining second level spell slots at level three, third level slots at level five, fourth level slots at level seven, fifth level slots at level nine, sixth level slots at level 11, seventh level slots at level 13, eighth level slots at level 15, and ninth level slots at level 17. Spent slots are regained upon finishing a long rest. The sorcerer does not get access to their full spell list, instead choosing a number of spells that they know based on their level. This number starts with two spells known at level one and increases at higher levels based on the spell's known chart. The sorcerer can swap out one known spell when they level up, but must choose spells of the same level for which they have slots. On the other hand, Sorcerer's Origins are the Sorcerer's subclasses that determine where their magical powers come from. They gain new Sorcerer's Origin features at levels 6, 14, and 18. We'll discuss these in more detail later in the video. At level 2, the Sorcerer gains the Font of Magic ability, which gives them sorcery points that can be used to regain spell slots until the end of the next long rest. They start with two sorcery points at level two and gain one more sorcery point per additional level. Spell slots can also be sacrificed and turned into sorcery points as seen on the conversion chart, which can then be spent to regain other spell slots. At level three, the sorcerer gains metamagic, which gives the sorcerer two of the eight metamagic options to use when casting spells and accent the spell cast with a unique ability or modifier. The sorcerer gains an additional metamagic option at levels 10 and 17. At level 4, the sorcerer gains their first ability score improvement. Ability score improvements add plus 2 to 1 ability score or plus 1 to 2 ability scores, up to the soft cap of 20. Sorcerers gain 5 ability score increases as they level up, and if the DM is using the optional feats rule, you can forego an ability score improvement to take a feat instead. Jumping all the way up to level 20, the Sorcerer gains Sorceress Restoration, which lets the Sorcerer regain four expended sorcery points whenever they finish a short rest. With these base abilities, we can see that the Sorcerer relies on a core selection of spells to know that are then accented by metamagic options to make them more effective, all while using sorcery points to recoup spent spell slots throughout the adventuring day. Next, let's look at the sorceress origins the sorcerer can choose from at level one to determine the source of their magical power. There are eight sorceress origins available to choose from at level one. Now, I'm going to go through them in alphabetical order, but if you want to skip ahead to a subclass you want to know more about, you can use the timestamps in the description to skip ahead to the one that you're interested in. Aberrant Mind Sorcerers have been forever changed by an alien influence, granting a psionic flair to the sorcerer's abilities. When taking this subclass, the sorcerer gains psionic spells, which is an additional table of spells gained at certain levels that don't count against their spells known, as well as the telepathic speech ability. Telepathic speech lets the sorcerer choose a creature within 30 feet and use a bonus action to speak to each other telepathically for a number of minutes equal to the sorcerer's level. Further levels in this subclass grant the ability to cast psionic spells using sorcery points, resistance to psychic damage, advantage on charm or frighten saving throws, the ability to use sorcery points to transform into an aberration for 10 minutes, and eventually gain the ability to teleport up to 120 feet away, damaging and pulling in enemies near the space they left if those creatures fail a strength saving throw. The Aberrant Mind Sorcerer is a great subclass for a utility or control caster, granting a number of new spells and abilities that give the sorcerer something to do outside their meager selection of known spells. If you're new to the sorcerer and are worried about not having enough options in or out of combat, or if you just like the idea of eldritch or alien horrors influencing your character, 
the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer is the choice for you. Clockwork Soul Sorcerers are suffused with magic by the cosmic force of order, entangling them within the machinations of machine-like efficiency. When taking this subclass, the Sorcerer gains Clockwork Spells, which is an additional table of spells granted at certain levels that don't count against their spells known, as well as the Restore Balance ability. Restore Balance grants the ability to remove advantage or disadvantage from a creature's d20 roll within 60 feet as a reaction a number of times equal to the Sorcerer's proficiency bonus. Spent uses are regained upon finishing a long rest. Further levels in this subclass grant the ability to expend sorcery points to create a ward around the sorcerer or an ally, the ability to enter a trance that removes advantage from attack rolls against the sorcerer and lets the sorcerer treat rolls of a 9 or lower as a 10, and eventually unlocks the ability to summon clockwork spirits that can restore up to 100 hit points split between creatures within range, repairs damaged objects, and ends all spell effects of 6th level or lower. The Clockwork Soul Sorcerer focuses on support and efficiency, granting a number of spells and abilities that allow them to assist their allies and dispel harmful effects. While the added spell list gives them more options, the situational nature of some of these spells, coupled with the complexity of how some of these abilities work, means I would recommend the Clockwork Soul to a more experienced sorcerer player rather than new players who are still learning the game or the sorcerer overall. The Divine Soul Sorcerer is touched by the gods, commanding sacred power that can scare and undermine religious institutions. When taking this subclass, the sorcerer gains Divine Magic and the Favored by the Gods ability. Divine Magic lets the Sorcerer add or replace spells on their spell list with any spell from the Cleric spell list, and gain a free spell based on their character's affinity. Favored by the Gods lets the Sorcerer roll 2d4 when they fail a saving throw or attack roll and add it to the roll, potentially making it succeed once per rest. Later levels in this subclass grant the ability for the sorcerer or allies within range to re-roll the dice on a healing spell, the ability to manifest wings and fly until dismissed, and eventually can use a bonus action to regain a number of hit points equal to half their hit point maximum when fewer than half their hit points remain. The Divine Soul Sorcerer is an amazing support subclass, gaining access to some of the most versatile spells on the cleric's spell list but having to choose to replace their existing sorcerer spells to cast them. This vast amount of choice can be daunting for new players who aren't used to the sorcerer's limited spells known, but given the sheer strength of the spells on the cleric spell list, I would still recommend this subclass to new players who want to play a more supportive healing role with their sorcerer. The Draconic Bloodline Sorcerer derives their power from the blood of dragons, often from an ancestor creating a pact with an ancient dragon to imbue their lineage with magic. When taking this subclass, the Sorcerer chooses a Dragon Ancestor and gains the Draconic Resilience ability. The Dragon Ancestor determines what type of dragon your lineage derives its power from, and influences a specific damage type based on the ancestor chosen for later level abilities. This also grants the Sorcerer the ability to read, speak, and write in Draconic, and doubles the proficiency bonus for any Charisma checks made against dragons. Draconic Resilience increases the Sorcerer's maximum hit points by one, and gains one additional hit point every additional level. Additionally, when not wearing armor, the Sorcerer's armor class is equal to 13 plus their Dexterity modifier. Further levels in this subclass grant the ability to add the Sorcerer's Charisma modifier to one damage roll of a spell using the damage type of the Sorcerer's Ancestor, the ability to use a Sorcery Point to gain resistance to that damage type for up to an hour, the ability to sprout Dragon Wings and fly as a bonus action, and eventually the ability to channel Sorcery Points into an Aura that inflicts either the Charm or Frighten condition on a hostile creature that fails a Wisdom saving throw. The Draconic Bloodline is the Blastercaster subclass, 
meshing well with metamagic to apply more damage to spell attacks while simultaneously granting the sorcerer more mobility and durability through later level class abilities. Given the simplicity of this subclass's focus on dealing elemental damage, the Draconic Bloodline subclass is a great choice for new players, and I highly recommend it if you want to focus on dealing a lot of elemental damage with your sorcerer. The Lunar Sorcerer draws their power from the moon or moons of the planet, with their magic waxing and waning with the lunar phases. When taking this subclass, the Sorcerer gains the Lunar Embodiment and Moonfire abilities. Lunar Embodiment grants additional spells per the Sorcerer's level that don't count against their known spells, but with a catch. After finishing a long rest, the Sorcerer chooses what Lunar Phase manifests in their magic, gaining that phase's specific spells as well as the ability to cast the first level Lunar Phase spell without expending a spell slot. Moonfire grants the Sacred Flame Cantrip, which doesn't count against the Sorcerer's known cantrips, and allows the Sorcerer to either target one creature as normal or target two creatures within five feet of each other with the cantrip. Further levels in this subclass grant reduced sorcery point cost on metamagic for certain spell schools based on the phase of the moon, the ability to spend a sorcery point and change the lunar phase for lunar embodiment, a number of different passive buffs based on which phase of the moon is chosen, such as shedding light, advantage on dexterity checks, and resistance to necrotic and radiant damage, and eventually a powerful bonus action based on what lunar phase is chosen. The Lunar Sorcery subclass is a very unique utility subclass that pushes the Sorcerer to swap to the Lunar Phase that fits the situation best. While the additional spells granted help beef up the Sorcerer's limited spells known, the separation of these spells into phases helps add some player choice into the mix, making this subclass a fun and engaging way to play a utility Sorcerer. The Shadow Magic Sorcerer traces their lineage from Shadowfell itself, imbuing their soul with dark magical energy that comes out through physical quirks as well as powerful abilities. When taking this subclass, the Sorcerer gains the Eyes of the Dark and Strength of the Grave abilities. Eyes of the Dark grants the Sorcerer Dark Vision with a range of 120 feet. At level 3, this ability grants the Darkness spell, and the ability to cast it with Sorcery Points instead of a spell slot. Strength of the Grave states that when reduced to zero hit points, the Sorcerer can make a Charisma saving throw with a DC of 5 plus the damage taken once per long rest. If they succeed on this throw, they drop to one hit point instead, unless the damage done is Radiant or Critical Damage. Further levels in this subclass grant the ability to summon a Hound of Ill Omen to target, attack, and debuff one creature, the ability to teleport to Dim Light or Darkness while in Dim Light or Darkness, and eventually, the ability to spend Sorcery Points to transform into a shadowy figure, granting resistance to all damage except Force and Radiant, and allowing the Sorcerer to move through creatures and objects. While their spell selection isn't as varied as other classes, the Shadow Magic Sorcerer excels in the darkness, and can very easily create their own store-bought darkness when homemade darkness isn't available. Overall, the Shadow Magic Sorcerer works great as a debuffing control caster that can also dish out some good damage on their own. The Storm Sorcerer gains their powers from the magic of elemental air, with the magic of the storm permeating their very being. When taking this subclass, the Sorcerer gains the ability to speak, read, and write in Primordial, and the Tempestuous Magic ability. Tempestuous Magic allows the Sorcerer to conjure gusts of wind that allow them to fly up to 10 feet immediately before or after casting a first level spell or higher, ignoring opportunity attacks. Further levels in this subclass grant resistance to lightning and thunder damage, the ability to target nearby creatures with additional lightning or thunder damage when casting a spell that does lightning or thunder damage, the ability to control the weather around them, the ability to deal lightning damage and push an enemy away when struck by a melee attack, and eventually gains immunity to lightning and thunder damage as well as a magical flying speed 
that can be halved to grant at least three other creatures flight for one hour. The Storm Sorcerer is a more niche subclass that relies very heavily on having good positioning and fast mobility to effectively use its short-range abilities without exposing the Sorcerer to dangerous melee. Unless you're playing a race that can innately fly or has a movement speed faster than 30 feet, I would recommend caution when approaching the Storm Sorcery subclass. Wild Magic Sorcerers gain their powers from the forces of chaos that underline the powers of creation, often associated with the Fae or demons due to their unpredictability. When taking this subclass, the Sorcerer gains the Wild Magic and Tides of Chaos abilities. Wild Magic states that after casting a first level sorcery spell or higher, the DM may have the player roll a D100 on the Wild Magic table, immediately creating a magical effect based on the dice roll that range from helpful to harmful to downright weird. Tides of Chaos lets the Sorcerer grant themselves advantage on one attack roll, ability check, or saving throw once per long rest. Anytime after using this feature, the DM can have the player roll on the Wild Magic table to create an effect and regain the use of this feature. Further levels in this subclass grant the ability to spend two sorcery points to add or subtract 1d4 from a visible creature's roll, the ability to roll twice when rolling on the wild magic table and choosing which effect happens, and eventually allows the sorcerer to roll an additional damage dice when a damage dice from a spell rolls the highest number possible on the dice. Wild magic sorcery is unpredictable, unreliable, and downright ineffective when it comes to playing D&D efficiently, but it sure is fun as hell. Instead of focusing on whether this subclass is over or underpowered, players should instead ask themselves if they think it's fun to subject themselves to the random effects of dice rolls and the whims of their DM. If that sounds like a ton of fun to you, then this subclass is going to be a great choice. With all the class and subclass abilities explained, let's now look at how to build a sorcerer character if you want to try one for yourself. The sorcerer remains at the whim of what spells they choose to know, but this choice can still be made from a varied spell list, meaning that there is some versatility to be had. For this example, I'm going to make a level 1 blaster caster that wants to focus on dealing damage through spells. For ability scores, the sorcerer's highest ability score should be Charisma, to maximize their spell attack modifier, spell save DC, roleplay skills, and potential subclass abilities. Their second highest ability score should then be Constitution, to beef up their meager hit point pool as much as possible, as well as strengthen their concentration saving throws. The rest of the ability scores can be spread out as you see fit based on what you have available. Health is up next, and relatively simple. To determine the sorcerer's starting health, take 6 and add your constitution modifier to it. After health is equipment, which does offer some variety, but won't be super necessary since we're focusing on spellcasting. For my sorcerer, I would want to take a light crossbow and 20 bolts to give me an early game ranged option if I don't want to use cantrips, an Arcane Focus, which I can hold in one free hand to cast spells without worrying about material components, an Explorer's Pack, which has more useful equipment for adventuring like a bedroll, torches, and rations, and finally, two Daggers, which can work as backup melee or thrown weapons if I need them. With equipment done and dusted, let's take a look at the level 1 abilities a Sorcerer needs to know. At level 1, the Sorcerer gains their spellcasting and chooses a Sorceress Origin. For spellcasting, let's get our modifiers down first, then dive into the spells themselves. For the examples we'll go through, let's assume our Charisma modifier at level 1 is plus 3. My Spell Attack modifier is just my Proficiency bonus plus my Charisma modifier, and my Spell Save DC is 8 plus my Proficiency bonus plus my Charisma modifier. So, with a Charisma modifier of plus 3 and a Proficiency bonus of plus 2, my level 1 Spell Attack modifier would be plus 5, and my Spell Save DC would be 13. Now that we've got those listed, let's look at spells. 
At level 1, I know 4 cantrips and 2 first level spells, and have 2 first level spell slots. With this in mind, I'd want to navigate over to the Sorcerer's Spell List and choose 4 cantrips and 2 first level spells to learn. If I wanted to focus on being a Blaster Caster, I'd want to choose the Acid Splash, Firebolt, Friends, and Light cantrips, and the Burning Hands and Shield spells. With spellcasting sorted, let's now move on to choosing our Sorceress Origin. This can be a big choice at level 1, but since I already know that I want to be a Blaster Caster, I'm going to move forward with the Draconic Bloodline subclass, which means I'd gain the Dragon Ancestor and Draconic Resilience abilities. Since I'm already taking Firebolt and Burning Hands, I'd want a Dragon Ancestor that focuses on fire damage, so I'd choose the Red Dragon. I'd also need to note down that I know Draconic on my character sheet, and that my proficiency bonus is doubled for Charisma checks when interacting with dragons. For Draconic Resilience, I'd need to add 1 to my maximum hit points, and note down to add 1 additional point every time I level up. On top of that, I'd change my Armor class to be 13, plus my Dexterity modifier. Now, I didn't boost up my dexterity score a ton earlier when we were discussing ability scores, but that's why I took the shield spell just in case I get targeted. And that should sort out our level 1 abilities. Remember that you can only swap out one known spell for a new spell when you level up, so the choices you make here are going to be harder to change than other classes. So with our ability scores, health, equipment, and level 1 abilities all laid out, we have a level 1 sorcerer ready to go. And that is everything you need to know about the sorcerer class in D&D. A fairly versatile casting class, the sorcerer is in a unique spot when it comes to casting classes, but this uniqueness offers a new style of play that I think could be quite enjoyable to those willing to learn and master it. I, for one, do not think I'm going to be mastering it anytime soon, but what do you all think of the Sorcerer? Are they a unique blend of Warlock and Wizardry that brings a lot to the party? Or do they have too few spell options to remain viable as a dedicated casting class? Let me know in the comments below, or join us over on the Altworld Discord, which is linked in the description, to discuss it with the community. While you're there, feel free to say hi and check out our live courses that we run every week for free that cover any and everything you could possibly need to know to play D&D. If you want to help support the server and this channel, you can also check out our Ko-fi page in the description. Now, we've finally begun to reach the end of the classes to choose from with our polling, so there's not going to be a class breakdown poll this weekend. Our last poll determined that the next class breakdown is going to be on the Cleric class, so gather your vestments and prepare to pray for next week's video. And make sure to stay tuned for the week after that for our final class breakdown video on the Ranger. But that is everything I have for you this week. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate all of you who support us here and make sure to have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see all of you next time.